Hi folks, uh, we're going to go over the slideshow that I presented in class uh, for anyone that missed it uh, or wants to review it. Uh, today's lecture is called English 101 Basics, Moving Beyond Formula. The formula in this case is the formula that many of us learned while we were in high school or maybe in prior education, either at the college level or before. And it's basically that five paragraph essay format that so many of us rely on. Um, let's go through the syllabus. Uh, essentially, uh, this we don't need to go over again. Uh, please review the syllabus. If you have any questions, please email me and I'll be happy to answer those or save them for class and I'll be happy to go over them there. Uh, why are we taking the class? Uh, this is a quick uh, overview of essentially the logic for taking this class. Um, most of us rationalize education as a cost-benefit equation and expend our energy accordingly. What that means is we don't uh, expend the same amount of energy for all of our classes. We pick and choose based on what we think our major is or what we think is important. And the reason I say what we think is because the information for this knowledge is incomplete. You don't know what you don't know. Uh, most of us will discover many years from now that the classes that we were not paying attention to were actually worth paying attention to, but it'll happen after the fact. So um, one of the things that I want you to focus on is to not undervalue the transformative effect of new information. Every class you take changes you. Education is a process of change and you should not under uh, sell that process. You shouldn't try to bypass it and essentially make it an industrial process. You should accept the idea that uh, each class has something to offer so that you can customize your education to your own ends and to get the most out of it. Essentially, and this is very important, you are not a widget and this isn't an industrial process. It's up to you to invest meaning into your education. If you do, you can make every class a building project towards something more. Everyone needs communication skills. Um, there are only two classes that are required of all college students. One of them is math, and that teaches quantitative reasoning, which is very important for everything. And the other is English, because it teaches you how to argue, which is just as important for everything. Um, I am suggesting that every student watch the Ken Robinson video called Changing Paradigms. It's on the handout page. I do not agree with uh, Sir Ken Robinson's uh, assertion that ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder, is somehow a, a fraud, uh, but his other takes on education are spot on and are worth paying attention to. Okay, So I want you to invest in your education. I want you to get the most out of it because there is value in this. And if you take control of it and you don't let yourself be treated as a widget, if you don't let yourself be run through the mill, handed out uh, sheets of paper that tell you what classes to take and what order to take them in, and actually take charge of your own education, you can create something unique. One of the points I made in class when I covered this was that uh, if you graduate with the exact same degree as 50 other people in your class, everybody has the exact same piece of paper, then the only thing left to compete on is price. And basically you're pricing yourself uh, down. So in order to compete with your fellow graduates, you have to basically say, okay, I'll work for less than they will. So obviously you don't want to get stuck in that situation. So you want to create something so unique, so different, so personalized and so interesting to you, i.e. something you truly enjoy, that when you go out there, you're essentially saying, I'm a one and only one proposition and then the others are pricing you. That is the companies that want to hire you are pricing you and they're competing against each other to hire you. So you'll notice that uh, there's this huge discrepancy between the pay of some people in our society versus the pay of other people in our society. It has very little to do with differences in skill. It has a lot more to do with the simple reality of um, having those that unique set of skills that everybody needs at that particular moment. Okay. Next item. Uh, one of the big uh, points of this class is to teach something called the affective domain. 
Most of us mistakenly believe that there are certain subjects we are good at and others that we aren't. Okay, this is a form of self-fulfilling prophecy. You don't want to be in this situation. Uh, I always have students come up to me when we're conferencing over papers and they will begin the discussion of their papers by telling me, I know it's terrible, but, okay, well, hold on a second. If you begin the conversation with, I know it's terrible, how can I possibly lift up that paper? How can I come in and save the day? I can't. You've already told me it's garbage, okay? So instead of sabotaging your own writing, have a positive attitude and you will do far better. You want to develop what's called a growth mindset. Uh, and we're going to discuss this some more over the course of the semester. But it's something you can look up and work on on your own starting now. And you really want to develop this because attitude is everything when it comes to your classes. Uh, if you are a passive recipient of a class, you're making life very easy for the professor who can just skip over you. Don't be that passive person. Be active. Ask questions. Get involved. Make your professors do the job that they're paid for, okay? Okay. One of the things we want to focus on in this class is getting started on how to write an essay. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about how not to write an essay, at least not most of the time. All of us learned some variation of this formula very early on in our, in our education. It generally was this five-paragraph essay format, uh, it was an introduction with some kind of attention grabber that then led us into a thesis that had three subtopics in it. Uh, college of the Canyons is the best college in America because of its cafeteria, its parking, and its support services. Okay, that's very standard formula for subtopics. Uh, body paragraph one would correspond with subtopic number one. So again, in our case, it would be body paragraph one would be about the cafeteria. Body paragraph two would be about uh, parking. And then body paragraph three would be about uh, uh, support services. And then in the conclusion, you would tell them what you told them. So the formula was tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. What you want to get away from is the idea of formula just by itself. Formula is not thinking. It's just applying a tool. And not everything lends itself to this. Okay. Would you ever break up with somebody in a five paragraph essay format the way you learned it in high school? You know, come up with three subtopics for breaking up with somebody. It's kind of a ridiculous example. So just be aware that you want to make your writing work uh, based on the message you're trying to convey, not to fit everything to the formula that you were given. The formula sort of uh, reverses the order of things. Instead of focusing on the story you're trying to tell, you're trying to make the story fit the format that you're trying to use. Uh, it's the opposite. Okay. Um, and we can see this here. Okay. So you get an introduction with a thesis. Again, the last sentence of the introduction. Uh, this is the five paragraph format that I'm trying to get away from, by the way. Uh, you then have subtopic one, subtopic two, subtopic three, and then your conclusion. And notice the arrows. They all point directly back to the thesis. Everything has to go straight back to the thesis. And again, let's go with our ridiculous example of the breakup letter, and you get to see it here. Every year, 84% uh, of relationships end, leaving millions of people heartbroken. That's your attention grabber. Then you keep going blah, blah, blah. And then you get to your thesis. I'm breaking up with you because of the way you drink coffee, the way your mom looks at me, and because you cheated on me with my best friend. So subtopic one is going to be about coffee. Subtopic two is going to be about the way the mom looks at you. And subtopic three is going to be about cheating. Who are we kidding? The real reason you're breaking up with the person is because that person cheated uh, uh, with you uh, or against you. So uh, that's, that's the real reason. So why are you bothering with subtopic one and two? Because you're trying to use the format instead of making everything uh, or instead of focusing on uh, telling the story that you want to tell. Okay. Uh, does anybody actually want to write this? No. Uh, the formula is very limited. Okay. So does that mean you can't use it? No, sure. You still can, but be aware it's weak. It's very limited and it's boring. Okay. So don't use it, but there are certain places where it's still very useful. 
if you're ever caught in a situation where you just need to get something out, formula works really well. That's especially true on exams, okay? If you're taking an exam, it's a lifesaver. Think about it. Those three subtopics that you can just map out before you even start the essay essentially um, um, organize your essay for you. So again, if, if you run into a history class and they ask you, why did Napoleon lose at Waterloo? You may have no clue what the answer is, but at least you can get it organized. Uh, Napoleon lost at Waterloo because the weather was against him. Um, his troops weren't up to the task and his enemies were, um, his enemies surprised him. There you go. Um, essentially just come up with answers that are based on a formula. Okay. The five paragraph essay is essentially the Swiss army knife. It's never the best tool, but it's always better than no tool. If you're ever in a situation where uh, you have access to an actual screwdriver, you definitely don't want to use a screwdriver on this thing, right? Uh, you want to use something better. But if you have access to nothing other than the Swiss Army knife, it's definitely better than nothing at all. And on an exam, you're often in that situation where you really don't have time to think about how to write the essay. You just need to write the essay. And there it can be very useful. Okay. So let's move on from that. We're going to start talking about what goes into a thesis uh, once you start moving away from the formula. And you need to have two things in a thesis. Number one, you need to have a claim, an argument, assertion, interpretation, or even an opinion. Those are all basically variations on the same thing. It's always something that someone else can disagree with you on. If I tell you Magic Mountain is located in Valencia, no one can disagree with me. Either that's right or it's wrong. There is no in between. If I tell you Magic Mountain is the best theme park in America, oh boy, am I going to start a fight. All the Disney fans are going to sit there and say, no, it's not. All the Knott's Berry Farm people are going to say, no, it's not. All the people who know Magic Mountain really well are going to say, no, it's not. That's kind of mean to Magic Mountain though. Okay. But it's not enough to say Magic Mountain is the best theme park in America because if I started with that premise, I would end up writing a thousand pages. So I need to add one more thing, which is a way of limiting the argument. So let's go back to the idea that Magic Mountain is the best uh, theme park in America. Is that arguable? Yes, it is. So someone can definitely call you out on that and say you're wrong. Now I need to limit it. So I'm going to talk about only the speed of the rides. Now, am I going to tell, talk about funnel cakes? No. Am I going to talk about shows? No. All I'm going to talk about is the speed of the rides. And that I can manage in four to six pages. Okay. If I wanted to do this in the old way of the three subtopics, I could say it's due to the parking funnel cakes and rides. Again, that's not a very strong point, but you can do it. Okay. Here's what a good thesis does. It acts as a map for the paper. It lets the reader know where he, uh, where he, she, or they are going. Okay. It makes the paper length manageable by not being too short or too long. And it gives you flexibility in how the essay is organized. That's the real key point here. Flexibility. There are more ways to organize an essay than simply that five paragraph format that we talked about earlier. Okay. Here's a quick note that's important for this class. In this class, you must have an explicit thesis. Okay. In the real world, you often hide your thesis statement because it might be controversial or it might uh, cause someone to stop reading right there. If, if my argument was that students at COC are uh, annoying, foolish, and not worth teaching, obviously I'm not going to present that directly to my students because they're not even going to bother reading the essay. So instead I'm going to give examples and let them figure this out on their own. Uh, by the way, that is not true. So COC students are wonderful. But uh, for this class, you have to have an explicit thesis where you actually have a sentence that you can point out that you call the thesis. And the reason you have to do it is the same reason that when you're solving x plus 2 equals 4 in a math class, you have to actually go through the trouble of putting a minus 2 on both sides and solving, uh, you know, isolating your variable and then answering for the variable. And the reason is because even though you know obviously that x equals 2, you need to show that you understand the concept. Same thing here. I want you to be able to identify your thesis. Later on you can hide it, but for now I need it to be there. Okay? The key point here though is flexibility. 
we want flexibility. So let's talk about it. The five paragraph essay, that's it. That's the only way it can be organized, okay? But if you look, think about other ways of organizing it, so for example, if I was talking uh, about something, let's go back to the Magic Mountain example, and I want to talk about speed. So I might sit there and say, okay, when you first enter the park, uh, you know, you hang out to the left and you get to Revolution. And Revolution is a pretty fast ride, and it gets your blood pumping a little bit, and you're excited. So you keep climbing up the hill, and you get to Tatsu, and that's a pretty fast ride, so you are getting even more excited. You head down a little bit and you get on uh, Superman and now you're talking real speed. And so I, I can develop this idea that as you go through the park, it's getting faster and faster and faster and you're getting more pumped up. And because of this, and there you see the arrow pointing back towards the complex ideas or back towards the thesis, it's because of this that Magic Mountain is the best theme park in America, okay? So I can actually develop an idea over several paragraphs and then move back. Another way of organizing an essay is what's called a dialectic essay. And although it looks like it's a five paragraph format here, that's just the way it's organized. It could be 22 paragraphs, okay? You present one side, then you present the other side, and then you present a synthesis of the two sides. So for example, if I was arguing that Magic Mountain is better than Disneyland because of the speed of its rides, I could talk about Disneyland to start off with and show the speed of the rides. And the fastest ride at Disneyland, I believe, is only 25 miles an hour. Then I go to side two and I talk about Magic Mountain where I think the slowest rides are about 25 miles an hour. And then I can work into the th synthesis where I say, okay, because of that huge speed difference between the two parks, Magic Mountain is definitely a better theme park. You'll notice that the shape of the first and last paragraph are also different. Dialectic essays lend themselves to these really long, well-developed intros and conclusions where you start off on a very broad level and then you narrow down to your thesis. This is not a bad way of organizing your essay. Your thesis, by the way, can be anywhere in the introduction. Uh, and again, it could be in the middle of the third paragraph of your introduction if you wanted it to be there. Uh, it doesn't have to be the very last sentence of the first paragraph. Okay. Finally, uh, I am going to ask you to read Isaac Denison's The Iguana, which is a wonderful essay. Um, it has this unique uh, quality to it. It's exactly five paragraphs long, and it has exactly three subtopics. So in many ways, it's the most traditional essay you can imagine, and yet it's brilliantly written. It's only a page and a half long, and it completely subverts what you think an essay should be. So notice the question mark afterwards. Uh, for your first discussion, I'm asking you to analyze the iguana and see how it works and what you think it's trying to say, what its thesis might very well be, okay? So you want to give yourself as much flexibility in writing your essay as possible and your thesis is what helps you build that flexibility. Just remember, a thesis consists of an assertion, a claim, an argument, and a limiting statement to make sure that that is uh, that you can cover that in the short uh, span of four to six pages that you have, okay? All right, now we're going to move to um, uh, another topic, and if you want to take a break right now, feel free to. Uh, you know, you've been bombarded with quite a bit of information already, uh, but when you are ready, just push play again, and we will continue. All right, now we're going to turn to a very good story. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's a great story, but it's a good story to help explain what goes into writing an essay. This story is about the abominable Mr. Metzger. The story takes place in 1947 at Harvard University. And as the story opens, we find our hero sitting in an empty lecture hall, getting uh, ready to study with a friend of his. Okay, so here he is in this giant empty lecture hall. And the reason that, by the way, we have these giant lecture halls, and the reason that the story takes place in 1947 is that at the end of World War II, which ended in 1945, 16 million American veterans returning home were given something remarkable by the U.S. government. They were given access to a free education. 
So these people all started flooding colleges all across America. And they were not like your typical students. They were a few years older. They had just fought the Imperial Japanese Army, one of the toughest opponents in the world, or the Nazis, the other toughest opponent in the world. And they had beaten both of them. And so they were not intimidated by the likes of your professor. And they definitely were not intimidated by the professors they had in 1947. They asked impertinent questions. They weren't there to just get the traditional introduction to how to run your daddy's company. Uh, these were middle class people who were moving up in the world and they wanted something practical out of their education. So big, big lecture halls were the norm and a lot of questioning of education was also the norm. Metzger is not that student. Metzger is your traditional student. But as he's waiting there for his friend, the doors open and all of a sudden students start streaming in. Metzger has had the misfortune of overstaying his welcome and he is now intruding in on a regular class that's about to meet. Because there's so many students streaming in, Metzger can't get up. And as the last of the students walk in and he's getting ready to leave, the professor walks in. And unfortunately for Metzger, the professor is holding exams. So Metzger is put into a very difficult position here. Uh, if he gets up and walks out, it will certainly look like he's leaving because of the exam. So Metzger just sits there as everyone is taking the exam and he's bored out of his mind. He gets so bored, in fact, that he does something he should never have done. He picks up the exam. And as he picks up the exam, he looks at the subject for it, and he realizes that the exam is SOC Sci 101, otherwise known as Social Science 101. And he has an amazing epiphany at that moment. He realizes he is a person, and this is a test about him. Okay? And the little devil inside of him tells him, well, you're bored anyway, take the test. Metzger should not have listened to that little devil, but again, he is stuck, so he starts the exam. Since he has no clue about this class that he's in, he does something remarkable, something that I highly encourage students to copy. He actually reads the question. He reads the prompt. And the prompt is, look at the following two passages and explain what the problems with both of them are. Okay, so he has to read the two passages and then he has to explain what's wrong with them. So he reads passage number one and he actually recognizes the author. The author is Margaret Mead. And in 1947, she was pretty famous because she wrote, uh, she was an anthropologist who wrote about taboos, including human sexuality. And so Metzger had a little bit of knowledge about her. Because in 1947, the dirtiest magazine you could buy in America was not Playboy, which wouldn't come out until 1953. The dirtiest magazine you could buy in 1947 was National Geographic. And because it had pictures of naked people in it. And Margaret Mead was featured quite often in National Geographic. So Metzger doesn't really know much about her, but he knows she's an anthropologist. And he reads that first passage, and it's about life in the United States. And he knows that Margaret Mead is an American. And if you think about it, an American is going to have a tough time writing about America. Why? Well, because everything we do seems normal to us. Okay? So, for example, if you walk into the average 7-Eleven in the United States, you will find the drink sizes start at gargantuan and move up to super tanker. And any place else in the world, those sizes would seem just ludicrous. But here in the United States, they don't seem that crazy because when you look at it, the 64-ounce bucket of soda that you just got costs only 10 cents more than the 44-ounce bucket of soda that you could have gotten or the 32-ounce bucket of soda that you could have gotten. It's just a bit more expensive. So it, you sit there and think to yourself, I'm getting all this extra value. And so you grab that size. And again, that becomes very normal to us. And so we assume larger and larger sizes being available to us. Uh, outside of the United States, that would seem very, very odd. Okay. So 
keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, now, Metzger then looks at the second passage. Here's a problem. He doesn't recognize the author of the second passage. It's also about life in the United States, but the author in this case is unknown. However, he does recognize that the name is spelled in a unique way. The name is Jeffrey, last name is Gore, and the way Jeffrey is spelled is G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y. And Metzger realizes that that's either the French or the English spelling of Jeffrey. And he assumes it must be an Englishman because uh, he also notices that many of the words that he's reading have an extra U in them where they shouldn't. And that's a British custom. So he makes the assumption that this second writer must be English. You're not supposed to make assumptions when you're doing work like this, but given the circumstances, it's what he had to go with, so he went with it. And reading that second passage about life in the United States, well, obviously it's not American writing it, so what can the bias be here? Well, the English aren't exactly complete strangers to us. We've had a long history with them, and our language is very similar. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, the great playwright, once quipped that England and America are two countries separated by a common tongue. Instead of noticing the 99 words that we have in common, we always pick on the one word that is different. Okay, So uh, Metzger assumes that gore is flawed because it would be like asking a uh, a cousin of yours to write an, uh, an objective biography of you. Uh, a cousin can't do that. It, has, it should be a total stranger. So Metzger writes all that down. He's got a couple minutes left and he thinks to himself, wait a minute, in this class these readings were assigned. These people must be important and they must normally be considered good writers. So Metzger finishes his essay by saying that although Gore and Mead are flawed in their interpretation of American culture, they are excellent at what they do and the rest of their work is worth uh, while. At that moment, time is called. Metzger walks up to the front of the class to drop off his exam and starts heading out the door. As he leaves, he hears his name getting called. Uh, by the way, as he turned in his exam, he uh, obviously didn't put his real name on it. He just wrote John Smith on it. And as I said, he got called, by, uh, called out by someone who said, hey, Metzger. And Metzger turns around and uh, he notices it's a friend of his. And this friend says, I didn't know you were enrolled in this class. And then Metzger tells him the story. I'm not. I, I took this test because I was bored out of my mind. And Metzger's friend says, oh, you are so lucky. This is the hardest class I've ever taken. I've been working my tail off in here, and no matter how much work I do, I never get anything above a C. And Metzger said, wow, I'm sorry to hear that. What did you do on this exam? And Metzger's friend says, oh, I studied my heart out. I put down everything that Margaret Mead has ever written, all of her theories, all of her major ideas, and I did the same for Jeffrey Gore. And Metzger sat there and said, wow, that's really impressive. Good luck. I got to get going. See you later. So a couple days go by. Metzger sees his exam. I'm sorry. Metzger's friend sees his exam, goes, picks it up, is hoping and praying for a better grade. And he got a C. Then he notices that John Smith never picked up his exam. And he knows that John Smith is Metzger. So he picks up that exam. And what grade is staring him back in the face? No, it's not an A. This is Harvard. It's an A minus. Why did Metzger's friend get a C? Well, remember what the prompt was. Read the following two passages and point out the problems. Did Metzger's friend point out any problems? No. He just listed all of the major work that these people had done. So why didn't he get an F? Well, the answer is, but he worked really hard and it seems like he had a lot of information. So the professor gave him a C. But think about that. Would any of you want a heart surgeon who worked really, really hard in med school, but never quite figured out that whole ticking thing in the chest bit? I don't think we'd be too happy with that person. I think we'd all be much happier with a Metzger. Okay. Do you think Metzger's friend can keep his mouth shut? No, of course not. He starts yelling at the professor. 
my friend who's not even enrolled in your class gets an A. Meanwhile, I work my tail off and all I get is a C. And guess what? A couple minutes go by and Metzger is dragged out in front of a dean who starts yelling at him and asks him, did you cheat? And Metzger said, why? I'm not in the class. Did you take the test for someone? Do you have a John Smith in the class? No. Um, do you like anthropology? No. Is anthropology your major? No. Are your parents anthropologists? No. And they keep going through, keep going through, keep going through. Finally, in exasperation, they turn to Metzger and they say, look, if you didn't cheat, if this isn't your field, if all of these things, none of them are true, then what did you do on this exam? And Metzger replies in the only way that a student could ever respond to this, what I wrote was just Bull. Okay? Please note, I didn't say BS. BS is when you lie, cheat, or steal. Bull is when you think it out, use your reasoning ability, use your logic. Many of you have passed classes or passed exams this way. You walk into class and they're taking a test that you're not prepared for or you just didn't study enough for and yet you still passed, and you thought you pulled the wool over somebody's eyes or you got away with something. No, unless you BS'd your way through, which is not good. If you actually just bulled your way through, you used your brain to figure out an answer. Yes, you're lacking information in your answer, but at least you have it. And as I mentioned at the beginning here, this was a time of educational turmoil. So Alfred North Whitehead, who was one of our great educational philosophers, in exactly responding to this circumstance, suggested this following answer to the student who just says, it's all bull. Yes, sir, what you wrote is utter nonsense, but ah, sir, it's the right kind of nonsense. Okay? I, in other words, your bull is the right bull. If I know for a fact, look, if you answer something and say, well, uh, Jeffrey Gore is a Frenchman and the French hate America, then I know you didn't actually do any of the work, and of course you get an F. But Metzger reasoned out that this person was probably English. So if you get caught using bull, you automatically fail. But if you don't get caught, there's a very high likelihood that you'll get a much better grade than you anticipated. So William G. Perry, who wrote Examsmanship and the Liberal Arts of Study in Educational Epistemology, which is the first reading you have for this section, actually went and did a full breakdown of what happened with Metzger and his friend. And what he came up with was the idea that Metzger came up with an understanding of the material, which we're just going to call the assertion, the claim. It's what you know. Metzger's friend didn't do that. What he did was he just collected everything that was in front of him and just chewed it up and got ready to throw it up if he walked into class. Uh, to this day, I, re I still remember that y equals mx plus b. I think I still remember the quadratic formula as b squared plus or minus the square root of 4ac over 2a or something like that. And I seem to recall that the Krebs cycle produces 32 ATPs. None of that information I could do anything with, okay? I may remember the basic setup of it, but I don't remember what to do with it. And that's essentially what Metzger's friend did. He didn't understand the information. He just collected it. Sort of like a cow in a field. Eating grass, chewing it up, throwing it up, chewing it again, throwing it up, chewing it again, until finally being able to process it and you know, make milk. And what Perry came to the conclusion of was that in an ideal world, we want both the bull and the cow. Okay? We want bull and cow. Many years after this article came out, um, uh, Don Height, who was a professor here at College of the Canyons, added a third term to this equation. He called it steer. The steer is a castrated bull. It basically can't do anything on its own, but it can act as a matchmaker between the bull and the cow. You have a claim, you have some evidence, but the two need to be linked together. And in a sense, this is basically what happens in a legal proceeding. If you've been charged with a crime, the charge itself is the bull. 
all the evidence that the police collected is the cow, and then you have two sets of uh, lawyers arguing it. The prosecution is arguing that there is a connection between the cow and the bull, and your defense attorney is saying that there isn't enough uh, connection between the cow and the bull. How much is a bad lawyer worth? The answer is practically nothing, because if the lawyer is bad enough, you can just walk into court, fall on your knees, and start crying and hope for mercy. Okay? How much is a good lawyer worth? A lot. Same thing here. Without bull, you don't have an essay. Without cow, you don't have an essay. But the steer determines the grade you're going to get on the, in the, on the paper. Okay? The better the steer, the better the grade. So you want that combination of bull and cow backed by steer. And if you do all of that correctly, you end up with a calf, a baby cow. And essentially, that's when, a uh, when an argument becomes someone else's fact. So, for example, if you look at the picture at the bottom here, you'll notice a $20 bill. A $20 bill is essentially, a uh, is essentially an essay. Okay? It has an argument. I'm worth $20. It has evidence. Dead white guys, American symbols, uh, you know, the eagle, um, uh, the buildings on the back. It has all of this evidence on it. It even has sort of the wishful evidence of, in God we trust, uh, uh, with the hope that there might be divine intervention if everybody stops believing in this. But it's such an effective essay that people actually accept it as fact, and we live our lives with this as a fact. Okay? So uh, a very well-written essay has that amazing transformative ability. Uh, when I say we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you know, you feel your chest swelling, you feel, uh, you feel pride, you feel all these things. But that is essentially a statement of bull. It's just so well presented, and, and I don't mean any disrespect by that, by the way, but it's so well presented that we actually accept it and we make it part of our own understanding. So that's what a really good essay can do. Here's our sort of caught example for this. Uh, Magic Mountain is great because of high-speed rides. There's the statement of bull, because again, someone can disagree with, uh, with that. Here's our evidence, which by the way, in this case is actually false. Superman definitely does not go three times the speed of sound, but let's say it did, and there's your evidence. And then comes the explanation. Since it's one of many rides breaking the sound barrier at the park, Magic Mountain truly is perfect because of its rides. And this, in a microcosm, is essentially what your essay is trying to do. Okay? You obviously want to provide more examples to really, really reinforce your point, but that's the basic formula of it. Okay? Um, if you have any questions about this, please feel free to email me, okay? Because this is the crucial component. Uh, last summer, uh, over the summer when I was teaching this class completely online, this was the one thing that stumped so many of the students. So any of the students who didn't get a great grade in the class uh, was because they just never understood the whole uh, thesis part of it. And so they had nothing really to support. We need all three elements in order to do this effectively. All right, let's talk about takeaways, okay? Takeaway number one, uh, look over the syllabus and please email me any questions that you have. Takeaway number two, get the book, The Hot Zone, and start reading as soon as possible. You don't have to do it this week or next, but as soon as you can. Uh, we don't get to the book until the third paper in the class, the third graded paper in the class, so you have a bit of time, but as I said, the sooner the better. Know the drop deadlines. The first one is coming up this Sunday. If you don't turn in that first essay this Sunday, I will drop you from the course. Okay. Next, be aware of the big graded essays. There are four essays in this class. Uh, those are your graded assignments. You also have a discussion board that is also graded, and the very first discussion board is about Isaac Denison's The Iguana. And the first post on that is due this Sunday, even though it doesn't show up on your Canvas page, because you are responsible for one post and two replies. And if everybody waits until the 6th to do their post, obviously there will be no time to do replies. 
So please post your first comment by this Sunday. I think I covered the importance of the class. I think I told you why attitude is very important. And I hope you understand Bo Cowan Steer and that you start reading Perry's essay, which is located on Canvas. Hopefully, that'll get you started in the class. As I said, if you have any questions, please, please let me know or bring it up in class. For Wednesday, I would like you to have the student grading assignment done before you enter class. You're going to basically flip roles and you're going to grade essays and then we're going to discuss them. Okay. Have a great uh, couple of days. I will see you back in class. Bye.